So do we have any kids in the house? Kids under the age of 12, let me hear you make some noise. Oh, you guys sound like you're still in bed. If we have any kids in the house, let me hear you make some noise. All right. This is a message that is especially dedicated to you. I think this is a message that you will grow from. So I would love to see your beautiful faces. Don't feel so far away. Feel free to move up closer. I would love to see your faces. I want to begin my message by asking a profound question, one that I've addressed to hundreds of audiences all over the United States, one that I think that is so important that I've asked over the course of my 30-year career. Aren't you glad your nose is on your face <laughs> and not pasted on some other place? Be glad your dose is on your face and not pasted on some other place. For if it were, were it not, you might dislike your nose a lot. Now imagine if your precious nose were sandwiched in between your toes. Well, that clearly wouldn't be a treat, for you'd be forced to smell your feet. Now, I know what you're thinking, Gateway. Who is this guy that got on stage today and somebody might want to get him off the stage before it gets too far into this message? But you got to remember, typically when I speak, it's at elementary schools to third and fourth and second grade students, not at church. So today's message will be a bit different than what maybe you're used to. My hope is to restore and revive a childlike wonder within you. Maybe you're here and you're wondering, what is my next step? What might my next career move look like? Maybe you feel moved to start a new business or to pursue a passion project. For the next 30 minutes or so, what I want you to do is imagine yourself being back in elementary school to a time when you truly believed that you could change the world. Because Gateway, I believe you can do just that. So buckle up and follow along with me as I share my journey. I want to show you the story that God crafted for me all along when I didn't even realize that God was with me. Some people say, Dante, you must have been born with a pencil in your hand. And you know what? Sometimes I wonder if that's not true. Because I can't remember a day in my life when I didn't have a pencil or a marker or a crayon or a paintbrush or some kind of drawing instrument creating pictures on paper. Who here likes to draw? See, I see your hands. I think that everyone loves to draw. I see you and I've been drawing all of my life. As a matter of fact, this is a picture I drew when I was three years old. It's a picture of my mom. And she's holding my baby brother. Do you all see my mom in there? <laughs> Do you all see my little brother that she's holding? And apparently, my brother had an accident in his diaper <laughs> that fell out, and I included that in the draw. And I guess I've always been a very detailed kind of an artist. And the details never stopped. I've been drawing and painting and macrame and braiding and creating as long as I can remember. This is me when I was probably five or six years old. I was a terribly shy kid. I was paralyzed with shyness. Talking to people was out of the question. I had no faith in my own voice. I communicated through art, and my friends, they were in awe of my artwork. 
They told me that, Donnie, one day you're going to grow up and become a rich and famous artist. That hasn't happened yet. <laughs> This is me with my family. Yes, that's my mom channeling her Diana Ross and the Supreme hairstyles. Hopefully mom's not watching online this morning because she would not like that joke. I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa, the hog and corn capital of the world. Now I'll answer your question before you ask. Yes, there are black people in Iowa. <laughs> At least there was before I moved away to Austin in 1999. This is where I live today. I love living in warm, cozy Austin, Texas, where I've attended South Campus with my wife Tamara and my son Colby for the past 15 years or so. Thank you. When I was a kid, I wanted to grow up to become a puppeteer like Jim Henson. Does anyone here know who Jim Henson is? Jim Henson is the creator of the Muppets. So you remember Kermit the Frog, Miss Piggy, Ernie, and Bert. I wanted to be just like Jim Henson when I was a kid because I loved making puppets too. So I studied Kermit the Frog, and I figured out that if you make a pattern like this, and you cut it out, and attach that to fabric, and sew the pieces together, because when I was a kid, I loved to sew. I could sew better than my mom and my aunties and my grandma could sew. So I figured I would make this really cool puppet. But I didn't want just a really cool puppet. I wanted the best puppet that anyone ever made. So I borrowed an old wig from my mom. <laughs> and I cut it apart. I used buttons for eyes, and I hand-stitched the clothes, and I hand-stitched the shoes, and I dressed the puppet up real fancy. And I showed my mom. How do you think my mom felt about her creative puppet-making son? My mom was so proud, and she couldn't wait to share with my dad. Now, my dad worked a late shift, so he got off work late that night, and they woke me up out of bed. And my daddy came home, and he looked at me, and he looked at my mom, and he said, Honey, your son's making dolls? I know. You see, my dad was a sports guy. He loved to get up on a Saturday morning, and watch basketball games all day. My dad liked to watch football games all day long, so he wanted a son who was good at sports. So, braid, make puppets with fabric, that was for girls in my dad's eyes. But whenever I would get on that basketball court and run, and dribble a ball at the same time, I would fall on my face. <laughs> Because basketball was not my talent. You see, God blessed me with many things. Athletics, at least not at that time, was not one of them. You see, each and every single person here, God blessed you with a special talent something that you can do better than everyone else. And so I am curious what you are good at. What talent did God bless you with? And I have this idea, on the count of three, no matter what campus you are worshiping at this morning, I want you to yell it out. Buda, South, Pflugerville, Central, online, wherever you are. One, two, three. All right, all right, all right. So this is a multi-talented church. And don't just take my word for it. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says that God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Now, I want you to note something from that passage. 
It says each, not some, not just the rich and famous, but each. That means that if you have breath in your lungs, you are gifted. Now, what are you going to do with all of those talents and gifts in order to get better at them? That's right, I heard. You're going to practice. You're going to use the talents that God blessed you with. You're going to take the time necessary to develop your gifts. And so that's what I did. I drew and I painted and I macrameed and I braided and I created toys from empty toilet paper rolls or thrown out dishwashing liquid bottles. And I kept my fingers busy creating all the time. This is a picture that I drew when I was 15 years old. Now, again, I was not the kind of kid to come home. Thank you so much. I was not the kind of kid to come home from school and play sports. Instead, I opened up magazines like Ebony and Jet, publications that highlighted African American life and culture in America, and I drew the pictures of the movie stars inside. Anyone want to guess who this is? Patrice Russian. If you're under 40, you may struggle with that a bit. But it was artists like this who especially inspired me, and I wanted to use my artwork to inspire others. So I drew pictures of my pets, and I drew pictures of myself. Now, this is a self-portrait that I created when I was in high school, the ultimate selfie. <laughs> when I was in high school, we didn't have a smartphone to take a, take a selfie. You had to pull out that pen and paper and actually draw a picture of yourself. <laughs> I went to a community college where there I studied art, or commercial art, and that's the kind of art that's used on a product. So advertising, graphic art, layout, design, magazines, which prepared me for a book in, a, for a career in book publishing. Now, these are books that I designed and books that I illustrated as well. There, I spent a lot of time developing a style and media choices. Now, I painted this picture of my little baby daughter when she was eight years old. Anyone want to guess how old my daughter is today? 21. Someone said 21. My daughter is 40 years old. And she has six kids. Now, I know what you're thinking. Don, you don't look like you're old enough to have a 40-year-old kid. Well, okay, thank you very much for that. <laughs> but Gateway, you ever hear that saying that black don't crack? It's not true, Gateway. You see all this white in my beard? I'm cracking. I'm cracking big time. Now, up until this point, I had illustrated lots of ABC books, basal books that could be used in the classroom. But it was my dream that one day I would be able to walk into a Barnes & Noble bookstore, and up on the top shelf would be a book illustrated by Don Tate. And next to that book would be books illustrated by many other African-American um, illustrators at that time. That was my dream. But what do you think happened when I sent my art samples to publishers in New York? They rejected me. They said, Don, your artwork is not very good. They said, Don, your artwork is scary. They said, kids are not going to like your artwork. How do you think that made me feel? I felt sad, discouraged, disappointed. But do we give up when we feel sad, discouraged, and disappointed? No, we do not. Why? Because these are God dreams worth pursuing in spite of the adversity that we face while we're pursuing them. It was Pastor A.R. Bernard who was made famous the saying, 
Life is God's gift to us. What we do with it is our gift to God. So what does God want you to do with the discouragement? I believe that he wants you to dream again. Dust off your wounds and grab your pens and pick up your phone and try again. But whatever you do, do not give up. It was Paul in Galatians 6, 9 who says, Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And so I did not give up. I continued to send my art samples to publishers all over New York until finally a great big publisher called Disney gave me my very first book to illustrate. It was called Say Hey, a song of Willie Mays about baseball great Willie Mays. And this book launched my traditionally published career as an illustrator of children's books. Thank you. You see, I had reached the pentacle. I had reached the top of the mountain. So I thought, but God was not done with me yet. He wanted me to write too. Me? Write? The guy who can't seem to get two words off of his tongue in the right order? The guy who doesn't know the definition of conjugating a verb. (laughs) Writing was for people who had English or doctoral degrees. In my mind, writing was for people who had law degrees, not for people like me. God, please, that is out of the question. I resisted for a while, coming up with every excuse in the book. But eventually I gave in and I researched and I wrote this nonfiction book called It Just Happened When Bill Trailer Started to Draw. And to my shock and surprise, an editor wanted to publish it because she said, Don, we love your unique voice. It was early summer in Montgomery, Alabama. 1939, on downtown Monroe Avenue, an elderly man sat on a wooden crate and with a board laid across his lap and the stub of a pencil grasped in his hands, he began to draw a picture on the back of a discarded laundry soap box. Now, who was this man and what caused him to draw pictures at the age of 85? His name was Bill Trailer, and it just happened, some say. It just happened is the story of a once enslaved man who had an innate God-given talent for drawing. He drew pictures on the back of trash and today is known as one of our country's most celebrated outsider artists. And then after that, something incredible began to happen in my career. I won an award, and another award, and another award, until finally I won the biggest award in Texas, the Texas Writers Award. Thank you. Now imagine that. Me, the once shy kid who was afraid of his own voice, now a full-time award-winning writer. Nothing is too big for our God. It reminds me of Genesis 18, when God is talking to the patriarch of our faith, Abraham, And he tells him that even though your wife, Sarah, and you are very old, this time next year, you're going to have a son. And what does Sarah do? She laughs 
and she questions, will I really have a child now that I am old? But again, I ask you the question, is anything too big for God? At 90 years old, Abraham and Sarah had a child, and his name was Isaac, the fulfillment of God's promise to them. Friends, if God said it, he will complete it. Now, as a kid, my library featured many kinds of books with talking animals. Cats in hats, where wild things are, velveteen rabbits. I grew up reading Dick and Jane. Now, the thing is, Dick and Jane didn't have very many black friends. In fact, Black people didn't really exist in any of the books that I grew up reading. So when I first got into publishing, it became my purpose, my God-given purpose, I believe, to address the erasure of my people by telling their stories. People who have overcome great obstacles in the face of adversity. Oftentimes, their biggest challenge was simply the color of their skin. For example, people like the subject of my next book, the story of Jerry Lawson, known as the father of video gaming, the inventor of the interchangeable video game cartridge. You all are invited to my launch party in August at Book People. This is a man who made it possible for us to go from playing one type of video game, Pong. You remember Pong? He had a paddle, another paddle, bonk, bonk, bonk. Well, he had an idea. What if you put thousands of video games onto cartridges and now gamers can play so many games? Now, I can tell by the expression on many of your faces You may be wondering, Don, your books, your career, sounds kind of interesting, and I might even buy some of your books. But it's Sunday morning. I'm in church. What does any of this have to do with God? Now, that's the question that I had when I was first asked uh, myself. But you see, my story, my journey from shy kid artist to published author and illustrator and then public speaker began by utilizing my spiritual gifts, the gifts that God gave me to realize the purpose that he created for my life. When I was a kid, I thought my shyness was a weakness. I thought that my shyness was a handicap. What I learned over time is that my shyness was not a handicap. It was my superpower. My special gift from my heavenly father that kept me out of trouble. It kept my hands busy creating art. It kept me focused on telling stories. Shyness was in God's plan for me all along. You see, before we were even a twinkle in our mom and dad's eyes, God, our Heavenly Father, the ultimate creator, had a plan for us. He loved us enough to establish a purpose for the life that he would give us. He created a reason for why each and every single one of us would exist. And then he blessed us with gifts and talents that we could use to fulfill our purpose. And this is how generous our God is. He didn't just bless us with one talent. He instilled within us many. I mean, sometimes we may not even realize how many gifts that God has blessed us with, because sometimes it takes years for it to percolate within us 
before we even realize that they are there. In Romans 12, 6, God reveals that each of us has the ability to do certain things well. If you've been blessed with the gift of prophecy, that special ability to speak the message of God, then speak whenever you can. If you've been blessed with the gift of serving others, then serve well. The gifts that you've been blessed with are the keys to fulfilling the purpose that God has created for you. Now, I know that many of you are blessed with a multitude of talents, and yet you still have not figured out your purpose. Is that you? Well, here are a few things that you might consider. Maybe there's an absence of joy in your life. And I want to give you an example. I came to Austin in 1999 to work at the newspaper. My job at that time was to sit around in the newsroom and wait for something bad to happen and go out and draw a picture of it. There's an awful car accident on I-35. Go out to the scene, draw a picture of it. A family's house burns down. Go out to the scene and draw a picture of it. Now remember, I'm a visual storyteller, so I love using my illustrations to tell stories. But as a graphics reporter, I was miserable. Eventually, the newspaper industry tanked, and everyone, as you know, got laid off. And you might think I was pretty upset about that, right? During my exit interview, I remember the, the person who interviewed me said, Don, you're the happiest person we've ever seen get laid off. <laughs> and that interviewer was so right, I was thrilled because now I could go on to pursue that thing that God put me on earth to do, create children's books full time. One of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. Galatians 5.22 reveals that if you're not experiencing a sense of joy in your day and in your work and in your relationships, you are probably not living in God's purpose. Two, maybe you're chasing the approval of people rather than God. And I want to give you another example. When I first got into publishing, I was told that I had to win a particular award, and that one award would solidify my long-term success in publishing. So year after year, I prayed to God that I would win that award. And throughout the year, my publishers and I, we would wine and dine the judging committee. If one of my books was reviewed well in the New York Times, I sent that award committee a note. If I received a starred review from one of my books, I sent the review committee a note. And every year, I did not win. One year, however, all the buzz industry-wide was that Don Tate was going to win this award, the Coretta Scott King Award. On the night before the announcement, I could not sleep. I was anticipating how surprised I would act when I got the phone call. <laughs> because the winner gets a surprise phone call in the middle of the night. I never got the call, and I was crushed, and I was angry, and I would be lying if I told you I didn't shed a few tears. And worst off, I was frustrated with God. But you know what? The problem was not God. The problem was me. I'd put winning an award before everything, including God. You know that whole book of Exodus thing about worshiping no other God before me? That's what I was doing, 
worshiping an award, worshiping the approval of others, and that did not please my God. In pursuit of your purpose, do not, and I repeat, do not chase accolades and trophies or fame and recognition. Chase God. And if it is in his will, those things may come true. And you know what, Gateway? If I ever do win that Coretta Scott King Award, I will celebrate by doing my happy praise dance. (laughs) Because that's how I celebrate after all of that hard work and after all of God's blessings. Now, Gateway, I want to do a fun exercise to kind of illustrate um, what I spoke about. And while um, the the easel is is being bought out, I need an audience member to help me here, a brave audience member who who loves to draw. Excellent. If you could come up here on stage with me and join me. What is your name? Maggie? All right. So Maggie, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to give you this marker. Be careful, it's a permanent marker. And I'm going to have you put anything that you want to up here. It could be a big number, a letter, a funny shape, a scribble. And I'm not even going to watch. I'm going to let you just put anything that you want to up there. Make a mess if you want to. And I'm going to use my imagination and creativity and see Make it a little bit more difficult for me. A little bit more difficult. Let me see what you could do here. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. So you may have a seat. Thank you so much. All right. So I'm kind of looking at this and thinking it's a mess. But you know, one of the things is that God can use our lives to turn a mess into something that is very useful. So I'm going to kind of use my imagination and creativity here and add some shapes to what you've created here, Maggie. And then I'm going to add some more shapes like right here and some more shapes to the side like this right here. And then a shape like this and a shape like this. I'm going to add a shape and a smile, some large expressive eyes, and I've turned your nothingness into a lady with some pretty crazy hair. All right. All right. So now that you know how this works, I need another brave person to come up here. Someone who likes to draw. Let me see. Um, she can come up here and draw for me. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. Now, what is your name? Ellie. Ellie. Okay, so Ellie, you know how the, the, the scribble game works. I'm going to challenge you this time, and I'm going to turn my head and create a mess and see what you might be able to turn that into. Use your imagination and creativity. There's no right or wrong to this activity. I know sometimes if you feel stuck, I try to figure out where I can. Oh, I didn't have to even give her clues there. She jumped right in and started drawing. That's it. What is it? It's a piece of toast, y'all. Let's give her a round of applause here. All right, thank you so much. You may have a seat. Piece of toast, trying to make me hungry this morning because I haven't had breakfast here, so all right. Sometimes, Gateway, life feels like a mess. Life can feel like a random scribble, a collection of our good intentions mixed in with some of our brokenness. Throughout my journey, I've made a whole lot of mistakes. Some really, really messy, ugly, embarrassing mistakes. And typically, Gateway, I am a very transparent person. 
But I am not going to reveal my mistakes up here today because the last thing I need is to have them to show up on my Wikipedia page. Thank you. <laughs> With each of my messy mistakes, God has redeemed and restored me by using my good, my bad, and my ugly so that any success that I've enjoyed, he gets the glory. So don't play small gateway. Let your gifts shine. Let your passions impact the world. Dream again, draw again, and live. You were created in the image of the greatest creator. So do what God does, gateway. Create, my friends. Thank you.